an excerpt from A Short History of the Early Church by Harry R. Bohr. Chapter 1, The World of the Early Church. The Christian Church was born in a world that was already old. Great empires had risen and fallen. The glories of Egypt, Sumer, Babylon, Assyria, Persia, and Greece lay centuries in the past. Now it was Rome, the greatest of the ancient empires, that governed the civilized world. It was almost exclusively in that empire that the Christian Church lived the first five centuries of its life. Before beginning a discussion of the history of the Church, it is important to note briefly the main characteristics of the world in which it developed. In doing so, mention should be made of the Roman Empire, the Jewish background of the Church, the influence of Greek thought, and the various kinds of religion that Christianity found in its environment. The Roman Empire the Christian Church was born in the Roman Empire. This great and powerful commonwealth stretched from England to Persia and from the Sahara to northwestern Germany. The Mediterranean Sea was not then, as it is now, a sea touching the shores of many nations. It was rather a great inland waterway uniting the many provinces of the empire that surrounded it on all sides. Hundreds of tribes lived within the Rome's borders and nations with a history far longer than that of Rome were under its control the center of the empire was the city of Rome, and in Rome all the power of government was in the hands of the emperor. Number 1. Growth At the birth of Jesus, Rome was about 750 years old. It had been founded as a small village on the banks of the Tiber River in western Italy. It grew to become a town, a city, and a small state. By means of wars and treaties with neighboring states, it continued to expand. In 265 B.C., 500 years after its founding, Rome was master of the Italian peninsula. It then reached out westward, across the sea. In less than a hundred years, it had conquered the islands of Sicily, Corsica, Sardinia, and the powerful state of Carthage in North Africa, and much of Spain. Thereupon it turned eastward and northward. It conquered all the remaining lands around the Mediterranean Sea, all of Gaul to the north, and parts of modern Germany. In the course of this expansion, Palestine came under the control of the empire in 63 B.C. and became a province in the empire in A.D. 6. Number 2. Government Until 27 B.C., all Rome's territories were administered by a form of government known as a republic. In it, the Roman Senate was very powerful, and no single individual controlled the government. In 27 B.C., however, after disastrous civil wars lasting more than a hundred years, the full power of Rome was given into the hands of Gaius Octavianus, the nephew of Julius Caesar, conqueror of Gaul and one of the greatest Romans. Octavianus is known in history as Caesar Augustus, first and greatest of the emperors. With him, the Republic ended and the Empire began. He reigned from 27 B.C. to A.D. 14. He is the Caesar of whom it is written in Luke chapter 2 verse 1. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. Except for some fighting at the frontiers of the empire, the reign of peace begun by Augustus lasted more than 200 years. It was during these two centuries that the church, arising out of the life and work of our Lord, became an empire-wide witness to the gospel. Number three, boundaries. The boundaries of the empire were clear. On the west, its boundary was the Atlantic Ocean. From the Alps to the North Sea, the Rhine River separated Gaul from the unconquered Germany. Rising in southwestern Germany, not far from the source of the Rhine, the Danube River flowed eastward to the Black Sea. It protected the empire from the barbarian tribes to the north. In the east, the boundary was the Persian Empire. In the south, below the long, fertile strip along the North African coast, the Sahara Desert bounded the empire. Except for a few variations, especially in the east, because of the wars with Persia, these boundaries were maintained for more than four centuries. Number four, Pax Romana. In this vast empire, the Pax Romana, Roman peace, made trade and travel both easy and safe. By land, sea, and river, it was possible to travel from one end of the empire to the other. It also encouraged the development of culture in every way, leading to great achievements in literature, architecture, and sculpture. 
the study of law was greatly developed. The economy provided varying degrees of prosperity throughout the empire. Everywhere the Roman army was a symbol of Roman power, Roman law, and Roman peace. Not least, there was a common language, Greek, in which one could communicate in the larger part of the empire. A careful reading of the book of Acts will reveal many of the characteristics of the Roman Empire mentioned in this section. The Jewish Background The roots of the Christian Church reach back deeply into the history and religion of Israel. Salvation, said Jesus, is from the Jews. John 4.22 Jesus came not to destroy, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. Matthew 5.17 Those who belong to Christ are Abraham's offspring heirs according to the promise Galatians 3:29 As Palestine was part of the Roman Empire so the church is related and very deeply so to Israel the people of Palestine the earliest church was wholly Jewish her savior was a Jew and the entire New Testament was probably written by Jews it would therefore be useful to take brief note of Israel's history number 1 David to Alexander. The kingdom of Israel was founded by David, the son of Jesse, in about 1000 BC. He reigned until about 960 BC. David placed such a stamp on the kingdom and upon the kingly office that he became a symbol of Israel's later messianic hopes. After the death of his son Solomon in about 930 BC, the kingdom David had established was split into two parts. The northern part, called Israel, was taken into Assyrian exile in 721 BC. It was never restored. The southern kingdom, Judah, which had remained true to the house of David, had a longer history. In 586 BC, however, it too went into exile in Babylon. In 539, Cyrus, king of Persia, conquered Babylon. He allowed any exile who wished a return to Jerusalem to do so. The following year, a number of them returned to their native land. These returnees, in time, rebuilt the temple which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had destroyed. After the first return, other groups went back to Palestine. One of their leaders was Ezra, a priest who was deeply devoted to the Mosaic Law. It was his strong desire to make the observance of the Torah, Israel's law, a living part of Jewish religion again. The Pharisees, whom we meet so often in the Gospels and the Book of Acts, grew out of the movement to restore the law that Ezra had begun. Between 334 and 323 BC, Alexander, the young Macedonian king, conquered all lands east of Greece up to India and as far south as Egypt. When he died in 323 BC, his generals divided among themselves the empire he had created. Ptolemy became ruler of Egypt. His area of authority included Palestine, and it remained under the authority of his house until 198 BC. In that year, the house that he had descended from another general. Seleucus gained control of Palestine. The Seleucids governed Syria, much of Asia Minor, and all of Persia. This change in the government of Palestine had very great consequences for the Jewish people. Number two, the Maccabees. The Ptolemaic kings had permitted the Jews to practice the religion freely. For more than 250 years after the return from exile, the Jews had observed the Mosaic laws Ezra had taught it to them. Now their new masters pressed them to surrender their ancient religion and follow Greek ways. The leader of this movement was Antiochus IV, the Seleucid king of Syria. He came to the throne in 175 BC. When the Jews resisted his policies, riots and massacres resulted. The Jewish religion was forbidden, Greek religion was enforced, prostitutes were brought into the temple, and Jewish ceremony was prohibited, especially circumcision. Most offensive of all, the Torah was openly burnt. The rebellion against Seleucid rule that now broke out in full strength, 163 BC, was led by an aged priest named Mattathias and his four sons. Of these, Judas was the leader. Together, they are known as the Maccabees, that is, men who fight violently. In 141, the Jews gained complete victory over their Seleucid enemies, and for the first time since 586 BC, Israel again became an independent nation. She kept her freedom only 80 years. 
In 63 BC, civil war in Palestine gave occasion to Rome to establish her authority there. For the next 60 years, Israel was semi-independent, her rulers being appointed by Rome. In 37 BC, Herod, known as Herod the Great, during whose reign Jesus was born, became king with Rome's approval. After his death, the kingdom was divided among his sons. Archelaus received Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. Herod Antipas received Galilee and Perea, and Philip received the area northeast of Galilee. In A.D. 6, Archelaus was disposed because of misconduct and sent into exile. His area became a Roman province and was governed by Roman procurators. From A.D. 26 to 36, the procurator of Judea was a Roman named Pontius Pilate. In conclusion, a word must be said about the rise of the synagogue, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and about the Jewish dispersion in the ancient world. Synagogue and Sanhedrin Before the Jewish exile in 586 BC, the center of Jewish worship was the temple in Jerusalem. After the exile, the center of Jewish worship was the synagogue found in every local community of Jews. It had existed in Palestine before the exile. In Babylonia, the Jews, deprived of the temple, emphasized the synagogue for purposes of prayer, the reading of the scriptures, and teaching, more than they had done in the homeland. It was further developed and strengthened by Ezra and his successors as a means of teaching the law. The book of Acts indicates that where there were Jews in the empire, there was a synagogue also. It was from the synagogue that Paul began his witness in any city he visited. The leader or president of the assembly was called the ruler of the synagogue. He was assisted by a reader of the scriptures, a leader in congregational prayer, and an officer who had custody of the scriptures and presided in the absence of the ruler. The governing body of the Jews in Palestine was the Sanhedrin, literally. The word Sanhedrin means to sit together. Although it was under Roman authority, it governed the province in both civil and religious matters. In matters that were solely religious, the Jews outside Palestine recognized its authority. The Sanhedrin was composed largely of the Sadducees and Pharisees under the leadership of the high priest. Number four, Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the Jewish leaders from the time of the Maccabees onward. The Sadducees came from priestly families and were lawyers. They favored old ways and were opposed to change. Nevertheless, they supported efforts of the later Maccabees to introduce Greek ideas into Jewish life. In religion, they are chiefly known as denying the doctrine of the resurrection and the existence of angels and spirits. They also believed that the soul perished with the body. Thus, there was for them no future life. In nearly all respects, the Pharisees opposed the Sadducees. They were not a priestly class, but were laymen. They too were lawyers, but they believed that the law should be open to new interpretations. The Pharisees were ardent nationalists and therefore opposed foreign influences, whether Greek or Roman. They believed in the resurrection and in a future life with rewards and punishments. They were chiefly concerned with the outward observance of the law, in which spiritual attitudes played little part. It was especially this aspect of the religion that brought them into conflict with Jesus. The Sadducees had wrong doctrines. The Pharisees had right doctrines, but their lives contradicted their teachings. Therefore, Jesus could say, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do, for they preach, but do not practice. Matthew chapter 23, verses 2 and 3. The Sadducees lost influence and gradually disappeared after the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. The Pharisees carried on for a time, but they too disappeared from the scene with the destruction of the Jewish state. Number 5. The dispersion. So far, our consideration of Judaism has been limited to Palestine. It is important to note, however, that there were many more Jews outside Palestine than there were in it. Deportations of prisoners of war, but especially the interest of commerce, spread Jews in all directions from Palestine. It is estimated that during the time of the early Roman Empire, there were about two and one half million Jews in Palestine. There were one million in each of the areas of Egypt. Asia Minor and Mesopotamia, in addition to about 100,000 in Italy, North Africa, 
smaller colonies were scattered throughout the empire. The New Testament reference to the dispersion is impressive. John 7.35, Acts 2.5-11, with many other references throughout the book of Acts, James 1.1, 1, 1, 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Inseparable form from the dispersion was a synagogue. Together they established a natural base outside Palestine for the missionary proclamation of the gospel. The most important center of the dispersion was Alexandria, Egypt. There the Jews occupied whole quarters of the city. There the Old Testament was translated into the Greek language in 250 BC, thus making it available to the Greek-speaking world. It became known as the Septuagint. There also, Jewish intellectual life found its greatest spokesman in the famous Jewish philosopher Philo, about 20 BC to AD 42, to whom we shall return in the next section. Greek thought. Within the empire, the most important spiritual influence came not from the Romans, but from the Greeks. Roman power and Roman law controlled the military, political, and social and economic life of the empire. Greek thinking controlled the minds of men. Number one, early Greek philosophers. Beginning about 600 BC, Greek philosophers thought profoundly about the nature of the world and the meaning of life. Thales was the first of the philosophers. He lived in the city of Miletus on the southwest coast of Asia Minor. He believed that all that existed arose in one way or another from water. Anaximander, a disciple of Thales, thought that not water but the boundless atmosphere was the source of everything. The philosophy of Heraclitus, who lived in about 500 BC in Ephesus, also in Asia Minor, was more complex. The basic element of the universe, he said, is fire. Out of it all things arise, and to it all things return. Out of fire comes air, out of air water, out of water earth. Then earth returns to water, water to air, air to fire, and thus the endless cycle of change goes on and on. The combinations made possible by these changes cause the great variety of things that are found in the world but none of them abides. There is nothing constant in life, nothing that is permanent. Life is like a flowing river. One can never step into the same water twice. Indeed, Heraclitus made the river a picture of his philosophy, which he summed up with the words, All things flow. Nevertheless, the constantly changing world is controlled by a mind, a reason, which he called the Logos. This word should be carefully noted, for it played a very large role in the theological thinking of the early church. Thales, Anaximander, and Heraclitus all lived in Asia Minor, which had been colonized by Greeks. A similar Greek colony in southern Italy also produced philosophers. One of its leading figures was Parmenides. Living at the same time as Heraclitus, he taught the very opposite of the Ephesian philosopher. He believed that there is no change at all. There is only one thing that exists, being itself. All the change that we experience and observe is appearance only. The variety, the beauty, the sadness, and the joy of life are appearances that exist solely in our minds. Strange as these views may seem, they presented a fundamental problem with which all serious thought about life must struggle. They raised the question, how are permanence and change, reality and appearance, eternity and time, related to each other. How is the mature man related to the child out of which he grew? Change has made the child become a man, but permanence has kept the person the same. How is this to be understood? Number two, Socrates and Plato. With Socrates, who lived in Athens about 450 BC, a change took place in Greek thinking. He was more interested in the quality of men than in the nature of the world. Socrates taught that we can know only one thing with certainty, man himself. We can know what we taught to be and what the purpose of life is. To know this is to have true knowledge. This knowledge can be gained by proper education. Man has the power to make himself morally good. There now appeared in Greece two of the most distinguished philosophers of all time. They were Plato, about 425 to 345 B.C., a disciple of Socrates, and Aristotle, about 385 to 320 B.C., a disciple of Plato. The center of philosophical thinking had by this time shifted from the colonies to the motherland, 
specifically to Athens. When Rome was not yet fully master of Italy, when Palestine was still under Persian control, Athens was the brilliant cultural center of the world. Plato united in one philosophy the concern of the earlier thinkers to understand the world as a whole, and the concern of Socrates to understand man. With Parmenides, he believed that the real world was not the world that could be seen and felt. Mountains, trees, sky, river, fields, men. The real world was the unseen world, the world of the ideas. By ideas, Plato did not mean thoughts or opinions, or what we refer to as ideas. He meant spiritual realities that exist in an unseen world. In that world are the ideas of material things like tree, mountain, water, chair, and of spiritual qualities like courage, love, truth, goodness, and, not least, of the soul. These ideas exist in the unseen world in the order of the service to one another. At the very top of the pyramid is the idea of the good. But there is also another world, the world of matter. In its original state, matter is without form or shape. It is a disordered, unharmonious, formless mass, a chaos. However, we never see matter in that shapeless, formless way. The ideas stamp it with their character of order and meaning. It is this union of the perfect ideas with disordered matter that we see and experience in the world around us. Matter is the source of all evil, of pain, disappointment, imperfection, sorrow, and death. The whole world of nature and man comes out of the strange union of ideas and matter. This is the world of change that had impressed Heraclitus so deeply. All that is in the world is a poor copy of the eternal, true, unchanging ideas coming to express through their union with matter. Whatever is beautiful, moral, fitting, and purposeful in these copies comes from the ideas. Whatever is evil, painful, and destructive in these qualities is derived from the matter. Both worlds are equally eternal. Neither can ever gain a victory over the other. Man is a union of spirit and matter. When death comes, the soul welcomes it, for it can then return to its pure state as idea unburdened by nature. It was for this reason that the philosophers in Athens listened quietly to Paul when he preached the gospel to them until he spoke about the resurrection. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. Acts 17.32 In studying the history of the early church, it is necessary to understand the Greek view of the relationships between idea and matter, good and evil, soul and and body. If it is not grasped, it is quite impossible to understand properly the first four centuries of church history. The two major heresies of Gnosticism and Arianism profoundly threaten the truth of the gospel. The first one before, the second one after, AD 30, AD 300. Both arose out of a misunderstanding of man and of the world after the fashion of Socrates and Plato. Only a scriptural view of God, of man, of the world, and of their relationships to each other saved the church from becoming a witness to a false gospel. Number three, Stoicism. We must pass over the teachings of Aristotle and others to note briefly the major teachings of Stoicism. It was the dominant philosophy in the Roman Empire at the time of Christ and the early church. The name Stoicism is derived from the Greek word stoa, meaning porch was a name applied to a public corridor near the marketplace in Athens where men could meet to discuss affairs. It was here that Zeno, a native of Cyprus, taught philosophy in about 300 BC. His philosophy was named Stoicism after the place where he taught it. His teaching and that of his successors was, like Socrates, more concerned with human conduct than with the nature of the universe. He and his successors taught that only matter exists. There is no pure spirit mind and body are both material. Even God is material. The universe is his body and he is his soul. Stoicism, therefore, is a sort of pantheism, the teaching that all is God. Man is related to him as a drop of water is related to the ocean, as a spark is related to the fire out of which it shoots. God, as the world soul, governs all things, loves men, and desires what is good for them. 
Since man is related to God, he should follow where divine reason, called the Logos, leads. True wisdom and virtue consists in discovering where God's path for men lies. The truly human person does not resist God's leading. He surrenders himself to it, however painful this may be, for God loves him. Virtue is one, and it is undivided. The four greatest qualities of character are wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice. If one lacks just one of these qualities, he lacks them all. If he truly has one, he truly has all. To be free and happy means to know oneself, to know God's will for oneself, and to live according to that knowledge. Stoicism was religion as well as philosophy, but because it was philosophical in character, it was accepted only by educated men. The masses of the people were unable to reason things out as Stoicism required. Among the educated elements, however, some of the finest minds in the empire followed its teachings. One of these was Marcus Aurelius, emperor from A.D. 160 to 180. There was much in Stoicism that Christianity could and did use, but it could speak only to the educated. Even these, however, lacked the power to do what love and justice required. One of the cruelest persecutions of the empire against the church took place during the reign of Marcus Aurelius. The world therefore continued to wait for a religion that not only taught what was right, but also provided the power to do what was right. And number four, Philo. A philosopher whom we must note in conclusion is the Jewish thinker Philo. He was born in about 20 BC, died sometime after AD 40, and spent his life in Alexandria, the center of the Jewish dispersion. In some respects, Philo was more Greek than Jewish. He concerned himself with philosophy in a manner unusual for a Jew. He spoke and wrote Greek better than Hebrew. At the same time, he was and remained a genuine Jew. He found the highest divine authority not in philosophy, but in the Old Testament, especially the Pentateuch. Indeed, Philo taught that whatever was true in the philosophy of the Greeks had been said earlier by the Jewish scriptures. He believed that somehow the Greeks had obtained their major ideas from the Old Testament. Philo tried to combine the Old Testament scriptures with Greek philosophy in a united teaching. In doing this, he faced the problem of the doctrine of creation. According to biblical teaching, God created the world out of matter. Greek philosophy could not allow this. God could have no contact with matter, the source of all evil. And therefore, Philo, like the Greeks, put a mediator between God and the world. This mediator he found in the Logos. He is the greatest of the powers with which God is surrounded. In him Philo saw divine power that is less than God, standing between God and the world. Through him God has created all things. Later, this thought played a large role in the attempt of Christian thinkers to explain the relationship of Christ to God. Religion and the Empire The various philosophical views undoubtedly satisfied many educated minds. The masses of the people, however, were not educated. How could they find fellowship and peace with God? These could be obtained only by religion. Even among the educated, there was a feeling that philosophy could not provide final answers. There were many religions in the empire to meet these needs. They were broadly of three kinds. Number one, nature religion. Nature religion saw supernatural power in mountains, lakes, rivers, trees, the sun and the moon, and certain animals and men. It honored forces in nature and believed in the power of amulets and charms. Beyond these, there was belief in ancestors, in good and evil spirits, and in gods who controlled the destinies of men. Every religion of nature had its own myth and rituals, and a special class of men named priests who could recite the myths and perform the ritual ceremonies. Nature religion was always group religion. The personal element was largely absent. In a simple agricultural fishing or herding society, such a religion might seem to be adequate. For men living in a developing and swiftly changing world, it was not. They needed a religion in which the supernatural was more personal, a religion in which men could experience the supernatural in their troubled lives. This need was met by the mystery religions. Number two, mystery religion. 
The great attractiveness of mystery religion lay in the opportunity of fellowship with the divine that it offered. This fellowship was obtained by certain ceremonial acts. The first of these was baptism, whether with water or with the blood of an animal. This washed away uncleanness and made fellowship with the God possible. The baptism was followed by a sacred meal in which this fellowship was experienced. The sacred meal led to enlightenment, and in it the new believer received knowledge of the God into whose fellowship he had been baptized. In this enlightenment he also dedicated himself to the service of God. Having this knowledge, the believer could live in peace and die in the comfort of reconciliation with his God. The followers of mystery religion were not allowed to reveal the secrets of baptism, meal fellowship, and enlightenment. For this reason, the religion was called mystery religion. Mystery religion had a long history in the East, in India, Persia, Babylon, and Egypt. It was strong in the empire when Christianity began to spread. For a while, one form of mystery religion, Mithraism, was a very strong competitor of Christianity and was especially favored by the Roman armies. Number three, state religion. State religion had strong political aspects. Its chief element was the making of sacrifice to the emperor. Originally, sacrifices had been made to the gods of the state. In the earlier years of the empire, sacrifices were made to dead emperors. Later, living emperors were worshipped with sacrifice. The emperor was regarded as the god who gave order and prosperity to the state. In him, the empire was incarnated, as it were. State religion was therefore regarded as uniting into one loyal community, the great diversity of people and tribes in the empire. Any religion that recognized the god emperor and did not interfere with good order in the empire was regarded as legitimate religion. State religion was, however, religion without warmth, without fellowship, without union, without the divine, and especially it was religion without salvation. Thus concludes chapter 1 of Harry R. Bohr's A Short History of the Early Church.